Greetings, friends. Resident Evil storyline, should you consider it as a whole series, is somewhat chaotic and confusing, and it is hard to single out a solid and reasonable story from it. There is some integrity within individual installments, but as soon as you try to link those games with each other to get a single grand narrative, you realize that it is less of a story, more of a Frankenstein's monster. This is probably due to how many games are there in the series and how many different approaches their directors have tried during all those years. For 25 years, there has been so many plot twists and smaller stories, hence it's unsurprising that uniting them is a difficult task. Thus, in an extremely brief way, cutting off everything redundant from the main plot with a butcher's ferocity, I will try to go through the storyline of Resident Evil games to arrange serious major events in a comprehensible form so that people who were introduced to those with just Lady Dimitrescu, which are many, could have a basic knowledge of what's going on here. In this video, we will not consider every installment of the series, only the major ones. Those games, the plots of which can be omitted without prejudice to the main story, will be left behind. Games will be streamlined not by release date, but by plot chronology, therefore prequels will be discussed earlier, although they were obviously released later. If the remakes plot conflicts with the originals one, then the former takes precedence. According to the latest retcon, a woman, mother and biologist named Miranda, who was born in the late 19th century in Eastern Europe, lost her daughter during the Spanish flu outbreak. She lost her daughter, but found the megamycid fungus, capable of absorbing the DNA of living organisms and using it to recreate their copies. Flu for the daughter, fungus for the mother. If that fungus, for instance, consumes a human, it'll be able to somehow resurrect this person, create a clone using their DNA, but consisting of fungal cells instead of human flesh. And Miranda, who presumably went nuts after the death of her daughter, decides to resurrect her child using the Megamycid. Miranda's story will be finalized at the very end of this video as we get to know her in the eighth installment of this series. But for now, it is more important that Miranda met Oswald Spencer, an aristocrat and traveler who, being impressed by her megamycid and relying on her findings, together with James Marcus and Edward Ashford, founded the Umbrella Corporation. Its cover is pharmacology, but in fact Umbrella develops bioweapons, among the rest conducting operations in basements of mansions built specifically for those in the outskirts of the Raccoon City, the USA. Not only research of Miranda, however, gave impetus to the founding of Umbrella, but also the discovery of a peculiar African virus by the founders of the company. When modified, it causes horrific mutations in humans and animals and can be used to create a super soldiers called tyrants. They'll be mentioned frequently in this video. Anyway, Umbrella successfully develops a strain that turns humans into killing monsters, and eventually the virus leaks to the surface, where it starts infecting everyone. Umbrella came up with the idea of combining the produced virus with leech DNA and obtained a substance that turns humans and animals into zombies. As a result, zombie dogs roam around the forest near Raccoon City slaughtering people, and the police special forces Team Bravo is sent to investigate this. Their helicopter crashes, but the unit members survive and decide to split up. It seems to be the main tactic of this whole horror game series, to split up in any case of contingency. While wandering around in the woods, team medic Rebecca Chambers stumbles upon a train, and inside it she meets a bunch of zombies, which was to be expected, and more importantly, a guy named Billy Cohn, who was transported on this train to the death row for a crime he never committed. The train moves on, then crashes, just like our helicopter, breaches through a wall in a tunnel. Thus, Billy and Rebecca find themselves in the mansion of Marcus, one of the Umbrella's co-founders. 
They see that Marcus has undergone severe mutations there. His colleagues, wishing to get rid of him due to tense relations, shot Marcus and threw his body into a ditch, where it got beaten by infected leeches. The virus invaded and revived the body of Marcus, turning him into a monster that now wants the protagonists dead. As a result of purely scientific reasoning, Rebecca comes up with the idea that the virus is created using leeches and those suddenly are afraid of light, hence infected Marcus fears the light as well. Together with Billy, she opens the hatch through which the light shines on Marcus, weakening him, and fills him full of lead. And it works. Prior to his death, though, Marcus initiates self-destruction of the mansion, but Rebecca and Billy manage to escape. Billy takes his own path so we never meet him again, while Rebecca goes looking for her squad members in another mansion nearby, the manor of Oswald Spencer. Her mates should be there. Finding the members of Rebecca's squad is a tricky task, as they are all either dead or soon to be. Rebecca is the only survivor. Apart from her, headquarters acknowledged casualties among the squad, so they sent Team Alpha for searching, consisting of Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Albert Wesker, and Barry Burton. The player can pick either Chris or Jill, and having reached the mansion, the operatives decide to split up, of course. Barry Burton instantly goes missing, and Wesker turns out to be an Umbrella executive, inserted inside the Special Forces team to prevent them from finding anything in Spencer's manor. Incidentally, it was Wesker who covertly crippled the engine of the Bravo Team Chopper in the previous game. When all of the survivors gather inside the mansion, Wesker starts hunting them and eventually releases a tyrant mutant, a prototype bioweapon. By the way, tyrants are produced with the DNA of a high-ranking Umbrella executive, Sergei Vladimir. Sergei is his first name, and Vladimir is his last name, and that is not a totally proper Russian name, because both Sergei and Vladimir are first names. It's like John Kevin. It's theoretically possible, but still ridiculous. My wife has a friend whom everyone calls Dr. Medic, because he's a doctor and he obviously is a medic. He hates it, but it all lines up. Dr. Medic, John Kevin, Sergei Vladimir. Back to the business. This very tyrant is still an experimental one. It doesn't obey orders quite willingly, and its conscious life starts with eliminating Wesker himself. Wesker is not really dead, but we will leave it for now. For now, let's say he's dead. In the meantime, the tyrant starts chasing Jill and Chris, who are assisted in between by Rebecca from Resident Evil Zero. They fight back the tyrant, kill it with a rocket to the belly, and fly away by helicopter into the sunset after initiating self-destruction of this manor as well. Things are far from okay in Raccoon City. People turn into zombies, wild stuff. The only person doing fine is William Birkin, the Umbrella scientist responsible for developing a new strain of their brand virus. Suggesting that there is not much sense in staying in Raccoon City with his family, he decides to leave the city with a virus in his pocket. Employers of Birkin find out about this and send henchmen to him for a friendly chat. However, Birkin is not in the talking mood and being pressed against the wall. He injects himself with his own virus and turns into a monster. Birkin kills offenders and, being driven by his new animal instincts, starts chasing his own daughter Sherry to lay eggs into her. This can be done only with a body of similar DNA and Birkin has no other blood relatives nearby. Not only the crazy mutant dad is chasing Sherry in Raccoon City, another tyrant, Mr. X, is looking for her as well, programmed to search for the virus sample stolen from the lab, which Birkin hid inside the medallion of his daughter from his former employers. Yes, I know, that's confusing. At the same time, rookie cop Leon Kennedy and student Claire Redfield, sister of Chris Redfield from the first chapter, arrive in the city. Chris left for Europe to fight Umbrella without telling anyone, and now his sister is seeking him, starting from Raccoon City, where he was recently, as Claire knows. Both Claire and Leon are the protagonists. They meet by chance, help each other, but split up soon as this is the physiological need of all characters in this universe. After that, they act mostly independently. Young and green Leon 
meets young and seasoned Ada Wong, a cold-blooded spy working for unnamed competitors of Umbrella and hunting for the virus as well, but deep inside she is not alien for love. Leon dashes into the line of fire for Ada, shielding her with his body, and even snatches the virus sample from the lab for her, being confident that Ada is from the FBI. Eventually, Leon gets to know her true aims, as well as that she is not from the FBI, but unable to resist his affection, forgives her and continues to love her. Ada, in turn, also doesn't leave Leon to die, although she could, and assists him in a boss fight. The main role of this couple in the plot, apart from loving each other against all odds, is to finish Mr. X with a rocket launcher and activate the self-destruction of the Umbrella Lab. That's just some relationship goals here. While doing that, Ada falls dramatically into the abyss after the virus vial. Leon supposes that Ada is done, but in fact she survives and, albeit without the virus, hits the road away from Raccoon City. As all people should. This was Leon's storyline, or if you wish, Ada's storyline. Speaking of Claire, let's rewind time and look at this story from a different angle. She meets little Sherry, Birkin's daughter, who carries a medallion containing the virus. She loses this medallion at some point, but this is surprisingly insignificant. Sherry faces two major problems after meeting Claire. First, she is kidnapped by a crooked police chief, though he is dealt with shortly after by insane Birkin, who is persecuting his daughter. Second, Birkin still manages to lay eggs in Sherry, and despite she escapes from him, mutant eggs in the body of the girl are no joke. Then Annette, her mother and Birkin's wife, comes to the rescue. She is a completely mad scientist as well, obsessed with the intention of preventing anyone from stealing the virus sample created by her husband. In the end, ironically, it is Annette's husband who finishes her, since he is already a monster deprived of reason. But before her death, she had finally done some good and helped to cook a remedy for eggs in her daughter. Sherry is healed, and along with Claire and Leon, whose storylines coincide once again at this point, they hop on a train, where for the final time they are attacked by irreversibly mutated Birkin. The protagonists unhook the train car with Birkin, it explodes, and the three of them, Leon, Claire and Sherry, drive off into the sunset. The plot unfolds almost simultaneously with the previous game, hence things in Raccoon City are still far from ok. Zombies roam around the city, and the authorities try to somehow evacuate the civilians. Besides, after losing two labs, Umbrella has declared war against the Raccoon City police. With a crooked police chief, the corporation succeeded in disbanding the Special Forces unit, and its former members are being hunted by the Nemesis, an advanced version of the Tyrant. And now Jill, who survived the events of the first installment, is in her apartment, figuring out how to annoy Umbrella when the Nemesis breaks in. Jill runs, but not fast enough. Luckily, the rescue from the Nemesis comes from passerby Carlos Oliveira. He is an Umbrella mercenary, quite unaware of Umbrella's role in this ongoing calamity, and his task is to regain as much control over Raccoon City as possible with other mercenaries to somehow settle down the zombie apocalypse. Carlos takes Jill to his mercenary friends, including Nikolai Zinoviev and Mikhail Viktor, yet another Dr. Medic instance. Altogether, they try to fix a broken subway train to evacuate the residents. They succeed, but the nemesis attacks Jill again, killing almost everyone in the train along the way. Jill and Mikhail flee for the exit to find out that it was barricaded by the backstabbing Nikolai. Mikhail violently blows himself and the nemesis up, giving Jill a chance to survive. The nemesis isn't done yet, but Jill gets a window to escape. And a little side note, Carlos wasn't there. He was away on his business and didn't take part in the evacuation. Barely alive, Jill gets out of the subway to be attacked by the nemesis again. Although she manages to fight back, the tyrant still infects her with the virus, causing Jill to pass out. Carlos locates her, brings her to a hospital and finds a cure in the nearby lab. After the injection, Jill recovers and they receive a sudden announcement that the authorities have made a desperate decision to nuke the city in order to prevent the spread of the zombifying disease. 
The military is in the talking mood, however, for the time being. If Jill and her friends provide the authorities with a cure for the virus timely, the bombing will be averted. Jill and Carlos rush to the lab, where Carlos got the first dose, to obtain the second one. Their way is obstructed by Nikolai, who shuts down the elevator and releases mutants, although Jill manages to get an antidote capsule and even annihilate the nemesis with a railgun. Everything would be fine if not for Nikolai. He wounds Carlos, seizes the capsule from Jill and shatters it, dooming Raccoon City to the nuclear apocalypse instead of the zombie one. Together, Carlos and Jill overpower Nikolai and hop on a helicopter. Nikolai begs them to save him in exchange for the information on his employers, but Jill refuses. Both Nikolai and Raccoon City are split. They split again, I told you, they do it all the time. They are split into atoms by the military, who never received the antidote, while Jill and Carlos fly off into the sunset. Claire Redfield carries on with her search for brother Chris. She didn't find him in Raccoon City, as he was already in Europe by then, so now she is en route to Europe, Paris to be precise. There has been progress in her search. In Paris, however, she gets captured quickly by Umbrella Security and incarcerated in a private prison in the middle of the ocean. At this moment, the island is sabotaged by Albert Wesker, the well-known Umbrella agent from previous installments, and a superhuman, by the way, who survived through a series of experiments acquiring unprecedented strength, dexterity and vitality, thanks to which he got over the events of the first game. Experiments on Wesker were carried out then by the co-founder of Umbrella, Oswald Spencer. Eventually, he was slain by Wesker, arguing that it is only him, Wesker, who has the right to become a god. What he actually meant will be clear a little later. At some point, Wesker betrayed Umbrella for the organization named The Organization. Yep, that's its name. Sergei Vladimir, Mikhail Viktor, Dr. Medic, The Organization Organization. I gotta admit that screenwriters are at least consistent in their drawing. So Wesker is now sabotaging Umbrella, trying to snatch a sample of another virus, codenamed T. Veronica, from his former employer. Among these diversions is the spread of the default Umbrella virus on the island where Claire is imprisoned. Not the T. Veronica, but the one that zombified people in Raccoon City. The island plunges into the zombie apocalypse, well known to players. So the jailers set the prisoners free, like we're doomed anyway, so do whatever you want. And Claire is released as well. She teams up with another ex-convict, a guy named Steve Burnside, and the two reach a plane to escape. However, the owner of the island, Alfred Ashford, insane and suffering from split personality, the son of that Umbrella co-founder, Edward Ashford, is unhappy with the prison break and calls their transport back, well, not quite back, but to Antarctica, to another Umbrella base. Alfred disables the aircraft's manual controls, turns on the autopilot and forcibly launches Claire and Steve to the South Pole. Incredibly enough, it turns out the base in Antarctica is the place where T. Veronica virus is contained. To be exact, it is hosted in the body of Alexia, Alfred's sister, who developed the virus 15 years ago and locked herself in a cryo chamber after injecting herself with it. Independently of each other, Ashford, Wesker and Chris fly to Antarctica as well. Chris finds out what trouble his sister has got into and hurries to her rescue. And all main characters of the game eventually find themselves at the Umbrella Base at the South Pole. Deranged Alfred awakens his sister, the T. Veronica host and a mighty mutant, from cryosleep and gets immediately terminated by her, according to some version as a punishment for not waking her for too long. Then Alexia captures Claire and Steve for experiments. Chris arrives at the island, sets Claire free, and together they release Steve. It turns out that Steve had already been infected with T. Veronica. A multi-stage fight ensues. The mutant Steve strikes Claire, but for a moment he comes to his senses, confesses his sympathy for Claire, and turns against Alexia. She kills Steve. Wesker and Chris enter the brawl, however, Wesker flees with an infected body of Steve shortly after, and Chris, controlled by player, faces Alexia one-on-one, -on -one, overcoming her in the end. He activates self-destruction of the base, inserting the code Veronica in the console. 
and with Claire in his arms, flies away into the sunset. Leon gets promoted to a government agent and is sent to a Spanish village in search of Ashley Graham, the abducted daughter of the US president. Leon arrives in the village where insane cultists, led by the man named Osmond Sadler, practice implanting parasites that turn people into the analogue of a zombie. They are not devoid of their personalities and remain generally the same humans, but their will can be seized if necessary. The president's daughter was also implanted with a parasite, so upon her return to America she could infect the entire populace. It is a pure coincidence that Ada Wong, the love of Lian's life and an outstanding spy, arrives there as well. In this storyline she works for Wesker, who sends her there to get a bunch of these parasites for him. The force of love and circumstances make Lian and Ada, who pursue different goals, to join efforts, so together they free Ashley from captivity. Infected during the events with the zombie worms, Leon and Ashley get cured with some special laser device and, with the support of Ada, neutralize the cult leader Sadler. Ada acquires parasite samples and fly away into the sunset, Leon and Ashley do the same on a jet sky using keys that Ada left for them. An artificial city named Terra Grigia floats in the sea fully powered by solar energy sent to it by a concentrated beam via an orbital satellite. Once Terra Grigia gets attacked by bioterrorists calling themselves Il Veltro and facing their onslaught Morgan Lansdale, the head of the Federal Bioterrorism Commission, or FBC in short, decides to level the city just to be safe by burning it, increasing concentration of solar beam. A year later, Clive O'Brien, the head of the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance BSAA, the organization similar to the FBC, begins to suspect that something stinks in the incident with Terra Grigia burned to the ground by Morgan Lansdale, and that Lansdale leveled the whole city not of despair, but to push up the price and request additional funding and stroke a bargain with Il Veltro for this. At the same time, O'Brien cannot overtly send his agents for reconnaissance, confident that Lansdale inserted a spy inside his organization, and he actually did. O'Brien then fakes the return of Il Veltro and deploys his agents, including Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine and a few others, to handle the alleged terrorists. Since O'Brien has no idea who the spy is exactly, no one, and the player as well, knows of the true aims of the operation, and O'Brien's plan is that hopefully agents turning over every stone will somehow stumble upon the evidence of Lansdale's involvement. All in all, the plan comes together. Lansdale panics and, using the same satellite, tries to destroy the drifting ship that contains evidence against him, and the T. abyss virus, which, if released in the ocean, would contaminate all marine life. The player is tasked with neutralizing the virus and deflecting the beam. Lansdale counteracts, forcing the authorities to incarcerate O'Brien, and the FBC spy turns out to be the BSAA agent Jessica Sherwood. Jill and Chris eventually discover a sunken vessel on the bottom of the ocean with the true leader of Il Veltra, who survived the depth using T. abyss injections. Next to him there are records that confirm the suspicions of O'Brien and incriminate Lansdale. Il Veltra leader mutates into the final boss, the protagonists defeat him and send the records to the headquarters. O'Brien gets released, Lansdale arrested, the FBC disbanded, the BSAA gets resources and influence. In the end, it turns out that Jessica wasn't only faking her BSAA commitment by working for the FBC, but also faking her FBC position by cooperating with yet another pharmaceutical company, Tricell, on the order of which she obtained a sample of the T. abyss. After all the defeats that Umbrella suffered from the player, the corporation is shut down but is replaced by another evil pharmaceutical institution, Tricell, which was mentioned earlier. Formally, the company is run by Excel Guione, but de facto it is a part of the project by Albert Wesker. Just to remind you, he had undergone genetic trials before, endowing him with supernatural strength and endurance, and had survived at the same time, unlike most other test subjects. 
Wesker decided to subject the entire populace to these experiments. The weak would die, and the strong would form a new community of superhumans which would be reigned by Wesker. To achieve this, he came up with the idea of mixing African flowers that were used to extract the brand umbrella tyrant-making virus with parasitic worms from the fourth chapter. Supposedly, with these ingredients, one can make a drug capable of bringing humanity to a new tier of evolution. Most people will die, but the rest will turn into superhumans, immune to any disease. This project is called Uroboros. While working on Uroboros, Wesker faces the BSAA, specifically Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine, and seemingly kills the latter. Sometime later, the BSAA sends Chris, meaning the player, to Africa to bust a bioweapons dealer Ricardo Irving with other agents. Chris gets a settlement that needs his help marked on a map. Upon arrival, he encounters a pile of agents' corpses and a horde of zombies infected with parasites already well known to the player. Chris, accompanied by his partner Sheva Alomar, tracks down and corners Irving. Irving infects himself with a parasite and turns into a squid boss to be soon dead at the hands of Chris. At death's door, Irving rats his superiors out. Look for Xyla, he says. She is in another cave, not a castle. Although we seem to complete our mission having neutralized Irving, our conscience whispers that it is no time for homecoming. Heading into the cave, we find the flowers used by Umbrella for their virus, which are now processed by Tricell, and meet Axella. While chasing Axella, we stumble upon Wesker and Jill, who is actually doing fine but obeying Albert for some reason. Wesker leaves us to fight Jill, and we find the mind-controlling device on her chest, which wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been looking at her breasts. Knocked off her, Jill comes to her senses and joins us. Yet again we pursue Guillaume and Wesker, Albert infects Excella with a virus, thus she turns into a boss and dies at our hands. Wesker then fights us and we throw him into an active volcano. Wesker injects himself with the Uroboras super drug and evolves into the final boss to get a double RPG missile in his face, fall back in the volcano and burn to a crisp in the lava once and for all. The power of lava. It turns out that Albert Wesker had a sister, Alex, who was also subjected to Umbrella experiments. Umbrella is gone and Alex misses the experiments, so she intends to learn how to transfer human consciousness between bodies to ensure an eternal life. She masters her technology but faces an issue. One can only transfer themselves into the body of a person who knows no fear. Should they get scared, the process fails. For her experiments, Alex abducts Claire Redfield, the well-known protagonist of this series. Moira Burton, the daughter of Barry Burton, whom we met at the beginning of the first game. And Natalia Corda, the girl who lost her parents during the Terra Grigia catastrophe and forfeited fear. To keep it super short, Barry Burton comes to rescue his daughter. All together, Barry, Moira and Claire they wake Alex and fly away on a helicopter into the sunset. Barry promises to adopt Natalia, and in the post credit scene she claims to be free at last, grinning ominously at the camera. Apparently Alex has managed to settle on her body successfully. The plot of the sixth installment consists of several campaigns with its own protagonist for each one. All these stories are interconnected, although it seems opposite at first. Fifteen years have passed since Raccoon City has been destroyed, and the US president decides to declassify the information of this incident. However, he misses the chance to do so, and in front of government agents Leon Kennedy and Helena Harper, he turns into a zombie. Leon is left with no other options but to kill him, so he is accused of assassinating the president, which is technically what he actually did. What happened? Derek Simmons, the leader of the secret organization called The Family, is a die-hard patriot who believes that revealing the truth about Raccoon City will hurt the international political image of the USA, and it would be better to prevent public discussions on the bioweapons. Moreover, it would be wiser, he thinks, to make the bioweapons an instrument of the elite, such as Derek Simmons. 
and the less it is in the public eye, the better. Because you never know whom it will fall into the hands of, while Derek would only use it to defend America. Following this logic, Derek hired Nikolai Zinoviev and lobbied for a nuclear strike on Raccoon City, as we remember it, in the third installment. And in the sixth, it is Derek who orchestrated the poisoning of the president with the umbrella virus. To achieve this, he abducted Deborah, sister of Helena, and forced Helena to lower the president's guard. Helena did everything required from her, yet Derek never planned to set her sister free. He subjected Deborah to experiments, and having nothing to lose anymore, Helena and Leon set out to rescue Deborah before it was too late. Well, it is too late. Deborah turns into a boss. Ada comes to assist Helene and Leon, and the three of them kill Deborah first, then Derek Simmons. The protagonists obtain the evidence of Leon's innocence that leads to the withdrawal of the charges. Now is the campaign of Chris. Derek Simmons, dead by this point, was very fond of stability. It was crucial for him to maintain the status quo and prevent the president from violating it. Derek was also very fond of Ada Wong, whom he hired from time to time for special tasks. When she refused to do business with him, Derek lost his peace of mind to the extent that he turned his employee Carla Radames into the clone of Ada Wong using the virus developed by Carla. Carla, who is not really Carla by now, didn't appreciate this deed, rebelled, and to piss off Derek, founded the new Umbrella terrorist organization. Its name obviously is a reference to just Umbrella, although they are not related in any way. Carla knew that Derek was a fan of world stability, so to spite him as much as possible, she decided to destabilize everything and immerse him into a post-apocalyptic world. Carla sets up a bioterrorist attack, so the BSAA deploys Chris Redfield, Pierce Nevins, and a few other agents to counter it. Chris and Pierce identify Ada Wong as the leader of Neo Umbrella, unaware that this, in fact, is Carla Radames. Chris fails to thwart the attack, and so Radames successfully infects the Chinese city of Tachi, turning its residents into zombies. The family gets to Carla before Chris, seemingly killing her with a shot in her chest. Well, Carla is a hard nut to crack, so she evolves into a giant shapeless biomass. Then the true Ada Wong appears to deliver Carla, a clone of Ada, a fatal blow by taking a shot at a nearby tank with liquid nitrogen, thus freezing Carla to death. Nonetheless, the entire Chinese city is now contaminated with a zombifying virus, the disease is spreading rapidly, posing a drastic threat to the whole world. Chris and Pierce come up with an idea. Jake Muller, the bastard son of Albert Wesker, is being held at a secret underwater base of New Umbrella. Just like his father, Jake is immune to all diseases, including this virus. If Jake could be released from captivity, then his gene material could be used to develop a vaccine. Chris and Pierce set off to this base in search of Jake, encountering a mean and tough monster named House besides him, that was programmed to awaken should Carla, the head of New Umbrella, decease. Carla is dead, and House is up to wreak chaos. Chris and Pierce distract House, allowing Jake to escape, but are unable to defeat it in the fair fight. Pierce opts for injecting himself with the virus that he and Chris took from Carla, hence turning into a bioweapon. The mutated Pierce defeats House and convinces Chris to flee the damaged and therefore sinking underwater base alone. Here comes Jake's campaign, where we basically know all the twists already. Jake Muller, having strong immunity inherited from his father, is a rather slimy mercenary fighting for whoever pays the price. Now he is on the payroll of New Umbrella. The organization provides its militants with virus injections that turn them into bioweapons. Everyone gets a shot obediently, including Jake, however, nothing happens to him unlike the others. New Umbrella realizes that it is dealing with a person of supernatural genes, declaring a bounty on him shortly after. When fleeing, Jake gets to know government agent Sherry Birkin, who has grown up drastically since we first met her in the second chapter. Both are captured and transferred to the New Umbrella underwater facility. After that, as we know, he and Sherry are saved from captivity by Chris and Pierce. 
Jake leaves the new Umbrella prison being not only free, but also a different person. The friendship with Sherry altered his mindset, and if earlier he demanded $50 million for half a liter of his blood for vaccine research, now he's willing to save humanity almost for free for a token fee of 50 bucks. And finally, there goes the campaign of Ada Wong, where we, yet again, already know all the basics. Ada learns that Derek Simmons, her former partner, couldn't bear with her leaving, so he has molded his own Ada out of Carla Radames. Carla went nuts, which is understandable, and decided to infect the whole world under the disguise of Ada. Before the real Ada faces her evil copy, she helps Lynn and Helena to deal with Derek, secretly assists Jake and Sherry, hides from Chris and Pierce, who believe that it is Ada, not Carla, who is in charge of New Umbrella, and eventually Ada smashes the copy of herself, Carla Radames. Chris confirms with his own eyes that Ada is gone, unsuspecting that it was her doppelganger, so the only people who are aware that Ada is in fact alive are Leon and Helena. Sneaky Ada seems to be completely content with this matter. The secret criminal organization named The Connections, founded by a former member of Umbrella and engaged into bioweapons production, contacts Miranda, who, as we remember, discovered the Megamycid, a fungus capable of absorbing human DNA to create a copy of this person, but consisting of fungal cells. Such a copy will retain its human consciousness and appearance, and it'll be able to breed like a normal person, but its offspring will consist of the mold which is a very special mold. The connections offer Miranda assistance in resurrecting her daughter in exchange for her fungi samples, and she agrees. What Miranda did after will be revealed several minutes later when we cover the eighth installment, but as for now, the connections use the obtained materials to produce Avalyn, a bioweapon girl with strong psionic abilities, who can easily control the mind of anyone whom she contacts. With all her abilities, Evelyn also features two quirks. First, she's aging quickly, apparently due to the technology of her creation being not yet mastered. Even though Evelyn is around seven years old by the beginning of the game, she has a body of a granny. Nonetheless, it is a piece of cake for Evelyn to telepathically instill her childish image in people's minds, so that everyone perceives her as a child. Second, she is mentally unstable and completely obsessed with having a family, partly because she is a test tube entity and lacks love and care, and partly because this is an effective manipulative pattern embedded into her by the manufacturer. It is easier to gain trust of a victim as a child dreaming of a family. The connections transfer Evelyn by ship to America and two of their scientists, Alan Droney and Mia Winters, are assigned to babysit her in the process. En route, they are caught by the storm, and given that Alan behaves quite rude with Evelyn, the girl goes ballistic, killing the entire crew, except for Mia, whom she infects with the mold. The vessel is brought to the shores of Louisiana, and the survivors, Mia and Evelyn, are picked up by Jack Baker, the father of a quite normal Baker family. Evelyn freaks out on the poor bakers. She infects them with the mold, subjugates their minds and plays with them in her cruel game. Jack, being taken over by Evelyn, abducts people and brings them home, where they are turned into new family members, the molded. Mia Winters is held hostage by Evelyn and the bakers as well. She had spent three years there before her husband, Ethan, totally unaware that his wife worked for the bioterrorist organization and that she is still alive, received a message allegedly from Mia with a plea to come for her and a return address. Surely, being the protagonist of this game, Ethan comes, although it wasn't Mia who sent the message. It's a trap. Ethan infiltrates the baker's house and gets instantly killed by Jack. Shortly after, Ethan wakes up in a pretty good shape, but, spoiler alert for the eighth game, this is no longer him. The Megamycid cloned Ethan, including his consciousness and DNA. Ethan is, in fact, the mold now, in the shape of former self. Ethan has no clue about this, and most importantly, the player doesn't know this either. It's the grand plot twist of the ending of the eighth installment of the next game. Anyway, the so-called Ethan wakes up to get out of the trap and save his wife. 
At this point, everyone seems to be recoverably contaminated apart from Mia Winters and Zoe Baker, the daughter of Jake, who had the least contact with Evelyn, thus is less affected by her influence. So Ethan reaches out to her to work their way out together. Ethan engages into several skirmishes with the Bakers, solves riddles and stays alive for as much as possible. Which technically isn't possible at all, since he's already dead. Skipping the details, Ethan has got to get enough ingredients for Zoe so she could brew two doses of an anti-mold drug. Ethan brings the ingredients to Zoe, she manages to make the vaccine, and here Jack comes to the stage again, so our protagonist has no other option to defeat him but to inject him with one of the two doses, since Jack is virtually immortal thanks to the fungi that replaced his entire body. Jack dies because of the drug as he is nothing more than the mold. And in the canon version, Ethan gives the remaining dose to Mia, promising Zoe to help her later. Now is the time to deal with Evelyn. Fortunately, Ethan finds the laboratory of Lucas Baker, who, as it turns out, has been collaborating all the time with the connections that were safely watching Evelyn in the Baker's house from a safe distance. Lucas has been reporting everything to them and receiving the vaccine in return, so Evelyn couldn't control him. So Lucas is kind of nuts by his nature, not because of Evelyn. So probably this family wasn't alright even before her. In the lab of Lucas, Ethan synthesizes a necrotoxin developed by the connections specifically to neutralize Evelyn if necessary, and comes back to the house with this serum. He meets with Evelyn one-on-one, -on -one, resists her hypnosis with his strong will, and injects her with the necrotoxin. However, Evelyn has grown stronger by that moment, so she doesn't collapse from the serum, but turns into a colossal mutant instead. Normal bullets against her are like peas due to the enormous health regeneration, but then Chris Redfield arrives with his BSAA detachment to the rescue and drops Ethan a special pistol that shoots anti-regen rounds. They make a killing impression on Evelyn and Ethan and Mia are evacuated by the BSAA helicopter, thus concluding the main game. There are two add-ons to the main game, however. In the first one, Chris Redfield, having evacuated the Winters, stays on the scene to hunt down and finish off Lucas Baker. The second one is devoted to Zoe, who was left with no drug and for whom Ethan promised to return, but never did. It should be mentioned that after the collapse of Umbrella, Blue Umbrella, a decent organization that cleans up the mess created by the Bad Umbrella, was created. Ethan reports to them that there is some Zoe who needs help, Blue Umbrella sends field agents who do locate a barely alive Zoe, but then get knocked down by Joe Baker, also a family member and the brother of Jack, whose solitary lifestyle made him miss all the fun, so he has no idea what happened in the main game. Joe supposes that Blue Umbrella is here to kidnap his nephew Zoe. Eventually he understands what's what, but the dose brought by Blue Umbrella is not enough for Zoe, and one more is required. Besides, Jack, whom we thought we killed, suddenly appears, and he is not dead, so Joe has to take Jack down again, here a power gauntlet comes in handy, and make another dose of the vaccine. Joe succeeds in both tasks, a helicopter comes for Zoe, and she gets better. Finally, it is Miranda's time. She lives in Romania, and by the beginning of the game she is already around 150 years old. But that is alright, the knowledge gained from experiments with the Megamycid allows her to cope with all sorts of issues. Miranda can easily morph into anyone, either a young woman or a giant monster, she is on good terms with her body. Yet she cannot achieve the main goal, resurrect her daughter Eva with the Megamycid. The technology for this is in place, albeit there is no suitable body to hold the Miranda's child. Hence, Miranda founds a cult named after herself, turns the populace of the entire city into zealots, and conducts experiments on them to find the appropriate vessel for Eva. Using the Megamycid, Miranda created the entity named Kadu, a hybrid of a fungus and parasite worms. Miranda implanted the Kadu into her subjects' bodies to inspect how they would tolerate it. The better they endured, the higher were the chances that such a body would be suitable for Miranda's daughter recreated with the mold. 
No one took the kadoo from Miranda perfectly, though. There were no perfectly fitting bodies around. However, some made progress. That is how four bosses were created, including Alcina Dimitrescu, a huge vampire lady and major sales driver for this installment. And not only bosses, but all other lesser foes are also the result of the Kadu's implantation. Meanwhile, Mia and Ethan try to have a peaceful life and settle, guess where? In Romania, under the close supervision of the BSAA. Ethan is unaware that he is the mold, although Mia, the connection scientist, at least has some suspicions, but is still unable to confess it to her husband. Being different forms of life, though, Mia is a mammal, Ethan is a fungus, doesn't prevent them from having a child, so Rosemary Winters is born. Just like her father, she is made of the human-like mold. Confidential data on Rosemary somehow falls into Miranda's hands, so she realizes that this is the body required for her daughter. The moldy body is guaranteed to embrace the moldy gene material of the Miranda's child. So Miranda, capable of morphing into anyone, abducts Mia, transforms into her, and infiltrates the family to kidnap Rosemary Winters. Since the Winters have been closely monitored by the BSAA, Chris Redfield appears immediately and shoots Mia, who is not Mia but Miranda, right in front of unsuspecting Ethan. Ethan, his daughter, and the corpse of Miranda are taken to the BSAA headquarters then. Now Miranda is almost done with the resurrection of Eva, all that remains is to wait until the giant Megamycid grows a little as its powers are insufficient yet for the procedure. While Miranda waits, just to be safe, she cuts Rosemary into four pieces and gives each of her generals four bosses of the game, including Lady Dimitrescu a piece of Rosemary for safekeeping. Ethan Winters wakes up in the middle of the forest, where Miranda made his escort a bloody scene. He wanders around, finally stumbling upon the castle of Dimitrescu. Ethan is captured by this lovely damsel and hung on the wall in her bedroom. But being a married man, he escapes and faces Dimitrescu in a fight. Not that kind of fight, but in an actual fight. After defeating her, Ethan grabs some jar with a goo and flees away from the castle. Soon he meets a mysterious fat ass, a merchant who is suspiciously way too familiar with what's going on around here. This merchant explains to Ethan that the jar contains a piece of rosemary. She, so to speak, lost peace of mind. Ethan is appalled with this news, but the guy reassures him that it's still possible to sculpt rosemary back. The bottom line is to find the remaining three parts, meaning to kill three more bosses who possess these pieces. Ethan eliminates the bosses, collects all the pieces of this kid's Lego, but in the end he faces Miranda, who rips his heart out. Ethan falls unconscious and dreams instead of dying. In this dream, Evelyn is talking to him. Apparently, she is alive somewhere in the Megamycid mind. Evelyn presents us with an epic retcon, according to which Ethan has been dead since the seventh chapter. Embracing his nature, Ethan the fungus comes to his senses, his fungal cells patched up a hole in his chest. Nevertheless, Ethan's regenerative abilities are limited, and he has already started to fall apart from all the wounds he has suffered. Despite this, on his second attempt, Ethan defeats Miranda and takes back the wholesome Rosemary, who turned out to be powerful enough to reject Eva and not let her occupy her body. In the meantime, Chris rescues the true Mia, locates the Megamycid and plants a charge on it. Chris, Mia and Rosemary rush to the chopper, but Ethan refuses to evacuate, preferring to die in the explosion with the Megamycid. Ethan's family, together with Chris and his team, fly off into the sunset, leaving Ethan behind. After the credits, we see adolescent Rosemary. She visits her father's grave. A person in a black suit appears, claiming that her assistance is required to solve some problem, and jestingly calling her Evelyn. It seems that Rosemary bears some resemblance to her and is used as a weapon. Rosemary rides with the suit guy off into the sunset, but the figure of a man appears on the horizon, and the car stops. What this means, nobody knows. But the data mining legends say the mysterious man was Ethan Winters. 
Thank you so much for watching this video to the end. Thank you all for the views, comments and likes. And please be assured that there is a lot of new videos coming in which we will dive into the lore of many other series. So please subscribe to not miss new content. Have fun, stay tuned.